in the Shadow of Man, Chapter 11, The Growth of the Research Centre. When first I set foot on the sandy beach of the Gombe Stream Reserve, I never dreamed that I was taking the first step towards the establishment of the Gombe Stream Research Centre. But nine years later, there would be ten or more students studying not only different aspects of chimpanzee behaviour, but also observing baboons and red colobus monkeys. We took on our first research assistant, Edna Koning, soon after Flint's birth. Edna wrote begging us to take her on in some capacity, and since there had been too much work for me alone, even before Flo produced a son, we felt it was an excellent idea. Edna not only typed out my notes, but also learned to make accurate observations herself. Then, when I followed Flo and Flint into the mountains, I knew that if anything exciting happened in camp, Edna would record the events. In those days, we worked all day and far into the night. I dictated my observations onto tape, which meant that I didn't have to take my eyes off the activities around me. Edna typed out the tapes in the evening while I struggled with analysis for my PhD thesis. We started making an extra copy of the notes, three copies in all, and I marked this copy into categories of behaviour, grooming, submission, aggression, and so forth. Edna, Hugo and I cut these up and pasted them in their relevant sections into large files. This, of course, was immensely helpful for my analysis. The third copy was always sent off every month to Lewis for safekeeping, in case of fire floods or some other catastrophe at Gombe. Then, too, there was dung swirling. It was Hugo who first thought of washing the chimp's dung rather than examining dried samples for indications of what food had been eaten. Chimpanzees swallow many stones of fruits when they're feeding, so that we always had a good idea of what species was currently ripe. It's amazing how much of a chimpanzee's food seems to pass through the digestive tract only partially digested. Dung swirling was an excellent method of finding out how often members of our group ate insects and meat, and data gathered in this way, together with information gleaned from watching the chimps feeding, gave us a very good picture of their diet throughout the year. We swirled the dung down by the stream, putting each specimen in a large tin with holes in the bottom, adding water and swirling it round and round over a hole we had dug. Hugo, in addition to helping me with my analysis, had a lot of his own work. He was still, of course, financed by the National Geographic Society, and he did all the accounts, both his own and mine. He had to write out a lot of legends for his film and 35mm photos, and particularly in the rainy season, he had a constant battle to keep his photographic equipment in working order. We all worked so hard that Van, who came to visit us for a while that year, and who, of course, was instantly roped in for her share of the chores, suggested we take off one evening a week from our toils. This was an excellent move, and we looked forward to our rest nights as many people look forward to the weekends. On these precious evenings, we played taped music, had a couple of drinks round the fire, and enjoyed a leisurely supper, instead of swallowing down our food in one of the tents before rushing back to work. Sometimes, too, we had hilarious sessions of dice, liar dice. Nevertheless, even on these evenings, our conversation was almost entirely chimp. If our work had not been also our pleasure, it's doubtful whether we should have been able to keep up the pace. We were all totally immersed in the goings-on of our chimpanzee group. As Hugo so often said, it was like being spectators of life in some little village. Endless fascination, endless enjoyment, and endless work. Towards the end of that year, try as we would, we simply couldn't keep up with all the work. But new chimpanzees were constantly joining the regulars at the feeding area, 
and there was Melissa's baby goblin, as well as Flint, demanding very detailed observation. So we took on a secretary, Sonia Ivy, and she, like Edna, became fascinated with the work and with the chimpanzees. Sonia typed out all my tapes, which gave Edna more time to make observations and I to pursue my investigations in the forest. The chimps became increasingly tolerant of my following them, so that I was able to stay with them for longer and longer at a stretch. By this time, we had a group of 45 chimpanzees visiting camp, some of them regularly, like the Flo family, and others from groups normally ranging to the south or north, only when their wanderings brought them close to our valley. Apart from some of the very infrequent visitors, these chimps were so used to the setup of the feeding station that they showed no hesitation in wandering in and out of our tents, taking anything they fancied. We had, of course, profited from Chris Pirozinski's experiences. We were careful to put away all clothing and tin trunks, including our bedclothes, which we had laboriously to fold up each morning. Once, just after dawn, I heard an anguished yell from Van. When I went to investigate, I found that David Greybeard had caught her dressing. She was sitting half-naked on her bed, clinging frantically to one pyjama leg, while David sat beside her, one hand on her knee, sucking the end of the other leg. When I could stop laughing, I fetched a banana and stood with it outside the tent. David, though he pulled his part of the pyjamas quite hard, eventually let go and accepted the banana as a substitute, while Van quickly zipped up the tent and bundled her pyjamas to safety. There was no one to offer Rodolf a banana when, way up in the mountains, he suddenly left off grooming his chimpanzee companions and approached me with his hair on end, seized hold of my shirt and pulled. He looked so ferocious that I was just about to strip when, with his hair slowly sinking down, he sat close to me and began to suck the cloth right where he was. He stayed there fifteen minutes and then, with the tiny corner he'd torn off, returned to his grooming. Indeed, after a while, we began to feel that nothing was sacred. Quite often, we hid a couple of bananas in the pockets of our clothes, ready to smuggle the Fifi or some other youngster who'd been unable to get a share from the boxes. But as the adult males quickly realised what was going on, we had to stop that. The chimps, however, remembered our old hiding places for a long time. One morning, Hugo, just dressed and half asleep, let out a yell when Leaky appeared in the tent doorway, stared hard at him, lifted up his shirt and poked an inquiring finger right into his navel. It was Leaky also who noticed what seemed to him to be a most promising bulge in Edna's shirt, reached up and gently squeezed her breast. One day, unthinkingly, I put a tasty banana into my pocket for my own consumption. When Fifi tried to push her hand in, I moved away. Fifi stared very hard at the bump in my pocket and then picked a long, thin grass, which she very gently inserted deep down into my pocket. She withdrew it and intently sniffed the end. This apparently told her all she wanted to know and she followed me round whimpering until I finally had to give her the fruit. We also had to keep our egg supply very carefully hidden. Mr. McGregor, Mr. Wurzel and Flo were the three chimps who loved eggs the most. One day, old Mr. McGregor managed to make off with four hard-boiled eggs, which Edna had prepared for lunch. And it was well worth the loss for the laugh he gave us. The chimpanzee almost always eats an egg together with a large mouthful of leaves. Only when sufficient leaves have been stuffed into his mouth, along with an egg, does he crack the shell. Then he sits, savouring the egg leaf wodge for minutes on end. Mr. McGregor looked startled when he put the first of the eggs into his mouth. No wonder, for it was hot. He took it out, looked at it carefully, sniffed it, and 
then shoved it back in with copious handfuls of leaves. Then we heard him crack the shell. This obviously was even more puzzling. No delicious liquids ran into his mouth. He spat out the whole mass of leaves and egg and stared at it. He tried all four eggs, each time stuffing in more and more fresh leaves until he was surrounded by fragments of white and yellow egg and mounds of crumpled greenery. Another of our problems that year was to protect the tents. We fixed all the guy ropes high up onto the trees or onto a thick wooden railing which Hassan built around the tent. For the chimps had found that to yank out tent pegs one by one as they charged past during an arrival display produced spectacular results. For a while we had no further trouble. Then one day Goliath displayed straight through our open tent and as he did so, snapped in two each of the thick wooden tent poles, one after the other, as though they'd been matchsticks. In his wake, he left a crumpled mass of canvas, partially held up by those guy ropes that were attached to trees. Finally, we got some sturdy tree trunks, and with Hassan's help, erected these sunk in cement. They made somewhat unconventional, but very satisfactory, tent poles. For most of that year, the chimps' banana supply was our worst headache. For one thing, there never seemed to be enough boxes. The sun was making more almost non-stop, but every day, two or three, or even more, were put out of action by one of the chimps. Even when everything had been sunk into cement, some of the adult males still managed to break something. J.B. was the worst offender. He kept breaking off the steel handles of the levers, so then we couldn't close them. And he managed to snap even a strong cable, though the only part showing was a length of about seven inches between the cemented end of the pipe and where it was attached to the lever. It was a rather terrifying indication of the superhuman strength of these chimpanzees. It was all right when a group came in and left before the next group arrived, then we had a chance to refill the boxes from our little store. But we dared not open the store with a group of chimps in the vicinity. As it was, we were often surprised during an attempt at replenishing the boxes, and if JB or Goliath or one of the other big males swaggered up when we were holding a bucket full of bananas, we simply had to give them a lot. They were too powerful to trifle with. Worst of all was the problem of David Greybeard's banana supply. David remembered the good old days when he, Goliath and William had been able to make off with any bananas that were available. In those days, he didn't have to compete for a share with five to ten other hungry males. And David never hurried when he arrived at camp. He liked to let the other males rush on ahead so that by the time he arrived, most of the excitement would be over. Yet somehow, when he did come, we had to have bananas for him. Otherwise, with his lower lip pushed determinedly forward, he plodded into one tent after the other, looking for them. He pulled everything apart, pushed everything over, even ripped open mosquito net windows if the tent was zipped shut. The problem was, of course, that the other chimps also looked through the tents for hidden fruit, though not so thoroughly and disastrously as David. They quickly learned our different hiding places, so we constantly had to think of new ones. Even when David's supply remained intact, we still had the difficult task of getting it to him without the other more aggressive males noticing. And after we had, with great trouble, succeeded in getting a pile right into his arms, then Flo or Melissa or some of the other females usually clustered round and reached out, one after the other, to take fruits from David's pile. David seldom objected. After all, he would always be able to get more. <laughs> Life became increasingly hectic and impossible, and more and more I longed for those uncomplicated days when I roamed the mountains. In 1965, however, things began to look up. 
the National Geographic Society, which was still supporting the research, granted us funds for the erection of some prefabricated aluminium buildings. We chose another site, still further up the valley, which offered a superb view of the mountain opposite and a glimpse of the lake. Once again, all the work had to be done at night, but apart from the preparation of the cement floors, it didn't take long to set up the buildings. When they were ready and covered on the sides and roof with grass, they blended in well with their forested surroundings. The largest one contained a fairly big room for working and the filing of records, two very small rooms to serve as bedrooms for Edna and Sonia, and two even smaller ones as a kitchen and a store. The other building was for Hugo and myself. In addition, we put up a tiny hut as a banana store down in the valley just below the new camp. This time we had even less difficulty in acquainting the chimps with the new site. One morning when Hugo and I were up at the completed buildings, checking that everything was ready, we looked over the valley and saw David Greybeard and Goliath feeding in a palm tree. What luck! Quickly, we held up a large bunch of bananas. The two males screamed and hugged each other for fully a minute before rushing down and hastening across the valley. As it happened, 15 other chimps were scattered about the valley, and upon hearing the excited calling of David and Goliath, they too hurried towards us. The whole group converged upon the new feeding area. The only disappointment was that since the attempt was unplanned, Hugo had no camera to record the wild excitement, the embracing and kissing and patting and screaming and barking that went on before the chimps had calmed down sufficiently to start feeding. Within three days, nearly all the chimps, all but the most irregular visitors, had discovered the new site, and we were able to close down our other feeding area completely. The new buildings were so luxurious compared to anything Hugo and I had ever known at Gombe that it was heartbreaking for us to have to leave the place a few weeks after everything was finished. But Hugo had to start another photographic assignment for the National Geographic Society, couldn't afford to maintain a photographer full-time at the chimpanzee camp, and I had to spend nine months in England to finish writing up my results for my PhD dissertation. Not until Hugo and I had actually left the Gombe stream did we realise that during the year we'd made one grave mistake. We had encouraged Flint to touch us and we had tickled him gently. It had been a delightful experience and Flint had become more and more trusting. We'd marvelled that a wild chimpanzee mother could lose her fear of humans to the extent of allowing her infant to play with us. But Fifi had copied Flint's example, and so had Figan. At the time it hadn't seemed to matter. It proved, as my grooming of David had proved, that it's possible to establish a close and friendly relationship with a creature who's lived the first years of his life in fear of humans. Hugo and I were actually able to tickle Figan, to wrestle with him, rolling on the ground, although even when eight years old, the young male was much stronger than either of us. But when we left, when the potential of new research buildings dawned on us, when we started receiving letters from students asking if they could join our team, we realised the foolishness of our behaviour. For one thing, the adult male chimpanzee is at least eight times stronger than a man. If Figan grew up and realised how much weaker humans really were, he would become dangerous. Moreover, repeated contact with a wild animal is bound to affect its behaviour. We made a rule that in future, no student should purposely make contact with any of the chimpanzees. Edna and Sonia, who had soon learned to make accurate observation herself, kept things going for almost a year on their own. Since then, we've had a constant stream of research assistants working at Gombe. Gradually, our research programme has expanded so that for the past few years, we've offered facilities to those wishing to study baboon and red colobus behaviour. Some students 
have worked at the Gombe for one year as my research assistants, keeping up the all-important general record of the behaviour of known chimpanzees. Most of these young people had BA degrees and all put in hours and hours of work and added considerably to our knowledge of chimpanzee behaviour. Some of them elected to stay on for a second year, working as research students on some chosen aspect of chimpanzee behaviour. In 1967, there was a major change in the status of the Gombe stream. It was taken over by Tanzania National Parks and became the Gombe National Park. Game department scouts gave place to National Parks rangers with their own quarters down in the south of the park. Together with the National Parks authorities, we're slowly working our way towards opening a second feeding station in the south for the benefit of interested tourists and visitors. For two years now, students have been working in the proposed area, living on their own, trying to habituate the chimpanzees of the southern group, as, in 1960, I struggled to get our own group used to me. And so the Gombe Stream Research Centre has gradually expanded. Today, there are eight little sleeping houses up at the observation area, nestling out of sight in the surrounding trees. There are three larger buildings down on the beach and three more huts for the students working on baboons and monkeys. The African staff alone have quite a village down on the beach, grouped around the house of old Edi Matata. Dominic and Siddiqui and Rashidi are all still with us, and there are many more. It cannot be said that the conditions at the Gombe Stream Research Centre are in any sense luxurious. But the facilities are more than adequate for young people who love animals, exciting and fascinating research and hard work. The biggest challenge which we faced at any time has been the actual presentation of the bananas. How to offer them in a way most similar to a natural food supply and so as to affect as little as possible the social behaviour of the chimpanzees. There has been much trial and error throughout the years. To start with, of course, we gave the chimps bananas whenever they came into camp. It was so exciting to Hugo and me to be able to film and watch individuals at close quarters and regularly, that we didn't have to worry too much if they visited the valley more frequently than they would have done had the feeding station not existed. Also in those early days, the idea of really long-term research hadn't been born, and we were anxious to record as much as we could before we had to leave forever. After a few years, however, we realised that the constant feeding was having a marked effect on the behaviour of the chimps. They were beginning to move about in large groups more than they had ever done in the old days. They were sleeping near camp and arriving in noisy hordes first thing in the morning. Worst of all, the adult males were becoming increasingly aggressive. When we first offered the chimps bananas, the males seldom fought over their food. They shared boxes or, at worst, chased off another individual or threatened without actually attacking. When Hugo and I returned to Gombe in 1966, after I'd successfully completed my terms at Cambridge, we were horrified at the change we saw in the chimpanzees' behaviour. Not only was there a great deal more fighting than ever before, but many of the chimps were hanging around in camp for hours and hours every day. This was almost entirely due to Fifi and Figgin, and to a lesser extent Everett. These three youngsters had discovered that in order to open a banana box, all they had to do was to pull out the simple pin that served to keep the lever closed. Laboriously, Hassan had worked at the fastening, cutting threads into both pin and handle so that it had to be unscrewed rather than simply pulled out. This had worked for a couple of months, but eventually the same three youngsters had solved that problem too. Then Hassan had fixed nuts onto the end of the screws so that those had to be removed before the screws could be unscrewed and the pin pulled out. Just before Hugo and I got back, 
Vigan, Fifi and Everett had mastered that as well. Things were chaotic. Everett would go up to a handle, unscrew it, and then with loud food barks hurry to the box which he had thus opened. So of course did any other chimp in the vicinity, and it was rare for Everett to get more than a couple of bananas, if that, unless he happened to be the only chimp or the highest ranking one in camp. Usually he simply went round opening box after box until eventually he'd fed all the others, and then, if there was a box left, he got that himself. His only attempt at guile was to arrive earlier and earlier in the morning, presumably in an endeavour to be first in camp and have the field to himself. But the others came earlier and earlier too. Fifi and Figgin were far more astute. Both of them learned quickly that however many boxes they opened, they were unlikely to get any bananas when there were higher ranking chimpanzees present. So they just lay around together with Flo, waiting for the others to leave. Then, when there were no adult males in camp, they would quickly open a box each. Sometimes they couldn't resist going up to a handle and unscrewing the screw, but they didn't then release the lever and hurry to the open box if other chimpanzees were around. They just sat, with one foot keeping the lever closed, casually grooming themselves and looking anywhere except at the box. Once I timed Figgin, sitting thus for over half an hour. But of course, though the other chimps hadn't mastered the secret of the screws, they were bright enough to realise that if they hung around, Fifi or Figgin might eventually provide them with bananas. So they stayed in camp longer and longer. Sometimes they did manage to wear out Fifi's patience, particularly Mike, but not often. And so, day in and day out, the Flo family remained in camp, and it amused us to see that it was Flo who occasionally tried to lead her offspring away, just as the year before they had tried to lead her away from termite heaps. Only Flo had no lure, and after plodding off down the path, looking back over her shoulder again and again, she nearly always returned and collapsed once more in the shade of a palm tree. Whilst we were impressed by the intelligence shown by Figgin and Fifi, it meant that we had to devise a completely new system of banana feeding. Our next attempt was to install a large number of steel boxes made in Nairobi. These were battery operated and could be opened by pressing buttons inside the research building. One advantage of this system was that when a large chimpanzee group arrived, we could offer each of the adult males his share at more or less the same time. They no longer had to hang around waiting and becoming increasingly aggressive. Also, the chimps began to associate bananas more with boxes than people, for most of them never connected the pressing of a button with the opening of a box. We decided in addition to feed bananas on an irregular schedule. For two or three days running, there would be no bananas at all. We hoped in this way to prevent the chimps remaining in our valley for days at a time. The system worked well during 1967, but we had by no means achieved the final answer. The next problem was one that had been ever present, which had been growing steadily worse each year. Competition at the feeding area between chimpanzees and baboons. In 1968, when Hugo and I again returned to Gombe for a few months, we found that things were in chaos. One baboon troop, the camp troop as it was known, had taken to hanging around the feeding station, either in the nearby trees or on the other side of the valley from where there was a good view of our buildings. As soon as the chimpanzee group arrived, the baboons rushed in to try to get a share in the bananas. Over and above this, a second beach troop had started spending several hours each day in the vicinity of camp as well. The adult male baboons had become very aggressive, not only to the chimpanzees, but to humans as well. Some of our students were worried by the situation, particularly the young women, and rightly so, for a male baboon can be quite as dangerous an adversary as a leopard. 
For a while we tried to discourage the baboons by refusing to open laden boxes whilst they were near camp. But this merely built up tremendous tensions and frustrations in the chimpanzees who were there. Baboons and chimps alike knew that there were bananas in the closed boxes, and the longer we delayed opening, the worse the situation became. Aggressive interactions multiplied, and when the boxes were finally opened, there was bedlam. Something had to be done, and done quickly. First of all, we stopped feeding altogether. As Hugo and I had anticipated, the chimps, when they arrived day after day and found all the boxes open and empty, began visiting camp less and less frequently. Within a week it was very quiet, with small groups occasionally wandering through, peering at the boxes and trailing off again. The baboons stopped waiting too. After three weeks we began feeding again, very irregularly filling the boxes only when it was certain that the baboons were sleeping far away and wouldn't be around early in the morning. Meanwhile, work was going on for the construction of an underground bunker, stretching some ten yards from the main observation building. The finished bunker is about four feet wide and high enough for a person to walk upright. There's plenty of room for storing bananas inside, and boxes dug up from the slopes have been placed along either side. At long last, we have complete control of when and whom we feed. If some boxes have been filled, and then, before the chimps have eaten, baboons come in, someone goes down into the bunker, removes the fruit, and closes the back of each box. Then we open the front of the boxes, and so far as chimps and baboons are concerned, there are no bananas that day. If a small group of chimps arrives, it can be fed with the appropriate number of boxes and bananas with no difficulty at all. Since the construction of the bunker, we've had almost no problems. Only when the back of one box broke, Goblin discovered that he would squeeze through into the tunnel. He would emerge from the box with an armful of bananas purloined from the supply within. It's now possible to regulate quite carefully the frequency with which individual chimps are fed, and we ensure that none has bananas more than once in 10 days or two weeks. So the chimpanzees have, to a large extent, resumed their old nomadic habits. They wander through camp, for the most part, only when they happen to be in the vicinity. This means, of course, that we cannot get as much information as when they all came more frequently, but they pass through sufficiently often for the students to make fairly regular records on many individuals. For the past few years, we've collected information on the chimpanzee's behavior, both at the feeding area, where it is possible to learn a great deal about changes in dominance and other relationships between individuals, as well as to collect a wealth of data on infant development, and in the forests, under more normal conditions. The chimpanzees themselves have become amazingly tolerant of humans wandering along the mountain tracks behind them, almost like part of their group. And if they do get irritated, it's the easiest thing in the world for them to shake off their followers in that rugged terrain. How long the present feeding system will continue to operate smoothly, we cannot say. At present, it seems as though at long last we've hit upon the ultimate solution. When I look back through the records on the different individuals, the quickly accumulating life histories of chimps such as Flint and Little Goblin, how worthwhile have been the struggles and heartaches and near despair. And now, of course, we don't feed at all. We didn't realize back then chimpanzees could catch our diseases and we could catch theirs. And so eventually we stopped feeding bananas and all the observations today are done out in the forest. But this is history. This is how it began. And reading it takes me right back. Anyway, that's the end of that chapter. <laughs>